chair of the Kimberly Grosses residence of the WFP early morning, the Secretary General of Kimberly Grosses and the members of the executive committee. Hello to Sashmo and Fede Arnab, CEO of the UCC. I also see the Gaetan Cavalieri. Welcome, Gaetan, who is in the Sucho. The Honorable uh, former presidents of the WFDB, Eli Isakov, Shul's Schnitzer, actually the successor of Shul, Johan Tash, welcome here in Dubai. President of the Wadaiman March, uh, Alex Popov, we also see a lot of people of the mining uh, corporations here. Uh, welcome to the from the Bears, Andre from Arosa, Jim Pounds from the Million, Chama Lieberherr from the Diamond Producers Association, and of course, many, many, many friends, old friends from Antwerp, from Diamond Horses. I see Marcel Kruger here. I have been born to the instinct, to the reality, to the dragons. All protocol observed, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the party. Understanding the impact of global changes is not always easy. And it often requires taking a distance and bird's eye view on a particular situation. We're gathered here at the moment that the global diamond industry is going through a historic transformation. The center of gravity of the world is shifting significantly eastward. And the traditional balance of power is changing, and the diamond world is no exception to this general trend. Let me look a little bit back. I started my career uh, as a broker for the BTC, the marketing house. Years in Rome, the days of my home town, Antwerp, about 25 years ago. Uh, these were different times. The years of the sale of petroleum, more than 70% of the world's production of diamonds selling it all from the UK capital. Antwerp uh, back then was the secondary market for DTC. It was, and still is, the natural destination for our diamonds, distributing close to 80% of the world. And that was also the mother, the grandmother, and the grandfather at the same time of this business. It is there where diamond polishing was invented in 1477 by a guy called Louis de Bethlehem. It was there where the first diamond horses were established around the central station, because around the central station it was before cars were invented at the end of the 19th century. It was Antwerp where the first rules and regulations were written which were later copied by so many new upcoming centers like Dubai. We are not alone, and the others did. Rules and regulations of the World Federation of Diamond Horses will actually bring us together here today. What Antwerp had to offer to the market was simple. A stable political environment, a hard-working cutting industry, an ease of doing business, particularly the diamond business, and a welcome home for people of very different ethnical backgrounds and religion. It was in these days when I started the leadership of Dubai, one of the seven Emirates in the UAE, envisioned their future to position itself as a logistical, commercial, and tourist hub for trade between the West and the East. Because, and you may not know that, Dubai, unlike the other Emirates, had no oil and it had to envision a future beyond that. And the rulers of Dubai knew they had to do better than their peers to create wealth for their people. And one of the tools they established in the early years of 2002 was the UCC, then called Dubai Metals and Commodities Center. That happened just 40 years ago. It coincided with my first visit to Dubai. I remember it very well because after the dinner in the house of the Founders and Investment and Trade Authority, we drove to the Burj Al Arab. And really, I wondered why they had created such enormous lanes for cars when there were so few cars. The Burj Al Arab then was located outside of the city center, only on the two days 14 years ago. The rulers and their peers, most of which and then still in the early 20s, knew that the location of Dubai made it a strategic hub between these A place with 
rich with all facilities and accessibility. Centrally located between producing and consuming countries for most countries. And clever as they were, they knew that the ease of doing business and a fiscal friendly environment could attract companies to establish themselves in the market. But of course, they needed an infrastructure to put all these issues inside. So the plan was to develop, to build one tower, like a vertical Hofenstraat, to host these commodities amongst rich diamonds. The place was named Palmas Tower. Palmas Tower, today the home of close to 800 diamond and jewelry licensed companies and 400 more world related entities. Palmas Tower, today, the tallest business building in the Middle East, and the focal point of an area called JLT, Jumeirah Lake Towers. I arrived back in Dubai in 2006. Attracted by the ambition of these young guys, I was invited to be part of the story of a new world capital in Europe. And when I arrived, I often drove me around in JLT, but it was still, at JLT, the place where you are here today, it was still a piece of desert. And from his Range Rover, which we were then, uh, he pointed me at a site which then very much minister resembled the Kimberley mine in South Africa. It was not more than a hole in the ground, a big hole. Look there, he said. That's the almost town. Today, GLT, an area over which GMCC is the licensing authority is the home of 100,000 people who live and work in about 62 high-rise towers, hosting also more than 12,000 companies. Today, the DMCC welcomes more than seven new companies per day. Yes, you heard it right, per day. When I did a similar speech in 2013 at the Dubai Diamond Conference, it was only four new companies per day. Just imagine. No wonder why GLT is today the largest free zone in the UAE and also the fastest growing. Congratulations to the DMCC management because you created a town the size of my own town in just 10 years. The rise of Dubai has indeed been meteoric, especially as I have said after the crisis. I must admit that when the crisis hit us, barely two years after I arrived, we were all shaken. Of course, with the Lehman debacle, the whole world order had been taken apart, and it becomes more and more clear today that we are still in the repairing phase. My friends told me, come back home. Dubai was over there. Media all over the world spoke about it. I had not come to the city of gold, which was the historical name of Dubai. I had come to the city of Hamburg. The fairy tale ended in an island. But that was a little bit too much wishful thinking of the world. I stayed, and so did Dubai. And like a phoenix out of his ash, Dubai rose again, and in no time. And it's because the rulers decided to stand upright and hold onto their principles, which are low and affordable real estate prices, an excellent infrastructure of air and seaport, security, high labor ethics at affordable prices, hospitality, and an open and welcoming attitude for foreigners, a fiscal environment of no tax and ease of doing business, and all these small pack businesses in real time. Ladies and gentlemen, at the time that the West is still putting plasters on a broken leg, Dubai has become the destination of choice between East and West, and it starts to grow to its full potential. Since 2005, when TDE was established, Dubai has risen from anonymity to become one of the leading diamond trading apps in the world with a total value of about 30 billion. Within the UAE, diamond trade has become the second largest non-oil contributor to the economy. For those, amongst which many Western storytellers who believe all this is built on hot air, I want to refer to Transparency International Index, which is an NGO who bring the diamond industry countries in February 2016, just three months ago. In a study which monitors corporate and political corruption in international development, the UAE came out as second best 
amongst major diamond trade hubs. Ladies and gentlemen, who would have thought in 1990 that Dubai would have grown to become one of the largest trading centers in the world? Who would have thought that Dubai would be seventh on the list of favorite locations of the so-called world's high net worth individuals? After London, New York, Singapore, Hong Kong, Geneva, and Shanghai. Today, within an eight-hour flight radius, Dubai reaches over 4.9 billion people and approximately 65% of the global GDP. Between 1975 and 2008, Dubai was the fastest growing economy in the world. In the same period, the US GDP tripled, Hong Kong grew by a factor of seven, Singapore by a factor of 10, and Dubai by a factor of 11. That is why Dubai ranks as one of the top, fast, top five fastest growing cities in the world, according to a recent report that is having three hundred cities. I Airport is the busiest airport in the world, with 78 million international passengers each year. There are 6,000 weekly flights to 210 destinations. Last year, Dubai attracted 14 million overnight visitors and is on track to reach 20 million by 2020. In 2013, the UAE was crowned as the world's top humanitarian donor offering $6 billion in foreign aid that year, reaching leading communities in more than 140 countries. That is almost double the target set out by the United Nations for donor countries. Moreover, the UAE and Dubai in particular are also a young people's country. When I arrived here 10 years ago, there was already a great mix of cultures. The MCC itself employs over 40 different nationalities. But in these days, we saw more people with an Anglo-Saxon background, all from the region, and South Asia. Today, when you go out at night, you see literally people from all continents. It also looks like in the past five years, the Americans have discovered Dubai. This place, and we witness this in the MCC freezer every day, has the bus of a Silicon Valley style entrepreneurship coming to age. After inviting us last Thursday evening to a local celebrity, Sultano Kassini, who is very much involved in the art scene, gave me a feeling of Paris in the days of Lago Heaven. Artists who think that their work will change society. More importantly, I was the oldest guest of about 30 people. I'm not going to be changing anymore, but they will. All this is quite a contrast to the continent of Europe where I was born, where an aging population is opposed to essential structural changes, where anti-Semitism and xenophobia are again on the rise, the way security has become a concern, where third generation diamond players are leaving the business, where because of an imploding social model, a growing financial and fiscal imposition against the wealthy risks to create a toxic mix, which I fear, in this time symbolically, at one time they explode and provoke an exodus of the entrepreneurial class. Ladies and gentlemen, a nation where more than 200 people from different countries work and live can be challenging for the law enforcement authorities. Not so for the Europe, which is the most peaceful country in the region, and ranks ninth amongst countries with lowest crime rates in the world. On Tuesday last week, Lieutenant General Sheikh Saif bin Zayed al Nayan, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of the Interior, set out an ambitious plan of making the UAE the world's most peaceful nation by 2021. He also said the country was working towards a crime free society. The target is nine unrealistic, no far fetched. The UAE recorded 110 violent crimes last year by the United Kingdom, just to give an example, reaches the more than 1,000. I thought that I'm a place of law enforcement. Please note that the uncovered check which promises eventually to the state. Are we perfect? Of course not. We are still on the road that was just started some 10 years ago. But we know the diamond industry very well. And we realized that in 2016, the investments made in the past decades will pay off. 
We'd like to know that Mission Control is one of the few locations in the world where banks are willing to enter again into rough diamond funds, new banks. It's the only place which has available liquidity to help the diamond industry get through these difficult periods. Please come and join our diamond final seminar tonight at 5 p.m. in this venue. Specialized bankers will be part of a panel discussion on how we can take diamond financing to the next phase, because that will be me. We are also, ladies and gentlemen, not looking to other centers in an antagonistic way. We believe in mutual benefits, in cooperation, in ways we can make other centers also profit from the things we do. Only by facilitating the trade, by creating a playing field that is business friendly and accommodating, and where everybody has its role in an ever changing world. We will come, overcome today's challenges. Trying to bring each other's challenges will only result in less pain. That is not our intention, and I'm happy to see that that is the overall condition of the world. On behalf of the board of directors of the EDE, and on behalf of the 800 diamond companies in our master, we wish you an excellent World Bank Congress.